This is episode six with Larry Kuhn. Welcome to the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. I'm your host, Sergio Millis, and each week I'll bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover how to break in and succeed in sports and life. Thanks for spending some time with me today and let the experience begin. This episode is brought to you by Sports Business Classroom, an immersive sports business training and educational experience dedicated to preparing future sports business professionals. It is a one of a kind learning opportunity for those interested in the business of basketball and jobs in sports. Sports Business Classroom combines the best of all worlds into a single package. Great academics, hands-on experience, immersion in the Las Vegas Summer League, and interaction with some of the best minds working in and around the NBA. For more information about Sports Business Classroom, go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com. This episode is also brought to you by Hall Pass Media, a full-service marketing agency that specializes in brand consulting, event management, digital marketing, and creative design. For more information on Hall Pass Media, go to hallpassnetwork.com. Today's guest is Mr. Larry Kuhn, CBA expert and general manager of Sports Business Classroom. He is the author of the Salary Cap FAQ at cbafaq.com and is known throughout the NBA as a leading authority on the NBA salary cap. Larry has been profiled in the New York Times, LA Times, Orange County Register, and Sports Illustrated, and makes regular media appearances on TV, radio, and podcasts. He is also a regular contributor to ESPN.com and to BasketballInsiders.com. In this episode, we discuss how he became the Yoda of the NBA salary cap, what he's learned being the GM of Sports Business Classroom, and how pursuing your passion can open unexpected doors. Ladies and gentlemen, this was really a fun episode for me, and I hope you enjoyed as well. Without further ado, I give you Larry Kuhn. Well, the GM of the Sports Business Classroom his, himself is with us, ladies and gentlemen. Larry, welcome to the show. Thanks, Serge. Hey, so, before, wait, no, before you get started, first of all, this is what? Podcast number six? This is number and six. And you're just now getting around to having me on it. I mean, come I should on. be fired, right? You, I, we just need, I need to take you out back is what I need to do with you. I deserve it. No, I, I really, I for those of you who are who only know Sergio because of this podcast, I mean, Sergio is the glue that makes so much stuff around here work with the summer league, with everything else. And I know that you've always preferred to kind of be in the background. You're the guy behind the guy who's behind another guy, but you do great at this. And I'm really glad to see you like taking the lead and being out in front of the people on something like this. So I appreciate that. Much appreciate Checks in the mail. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and if you think you're going to get much of a word in edgewise tonight, nah, we'll see. That's what I'm hoping for. So many people refer to you as the Yoda of the NBA salary cap, and I, I do want to find out. I want I do want you to tell us the story about how Yoda became Yoda. But why don't you tell us a little bit about where you grew up? kind of what you were interested in as a kid. What was childhood like for you? You know, I grew up in suburban Orange County, California. In fact, I've lived here my whole life because you've seen the weather here. Why leave? Mm -hmm. And I grew up, um, my dad was a Lakers fan, and I kind of grew up with that as kind of the background of my life. And it's funny because my dad was kind of a guy of few words. So I always used to say that I might have heard more words more words out of Chick Hearn's mouth than my own dad's just because of the amount of Lakers games I listened to and the amount that he talked. I certainly learned the game from listening to Chick Hearn and watching the Lakers growing up. Uh, but I was I was more of an individual sport guy kind of growing up, okay. and I was a, I was mainly a cyclist. So I was doing that ever since I was in my early teens, and then growing up, and including doing it kind of full time um, in my late teens and early twenties, and not really uh, basketball. I used to say that I have too much respect for the sport to denigrate it by touching <laughs> a basketball myself. I, I love watching the game. I just was never really a player of the game okay. and team sports. The only thing I really like liked to do is volleyball, but yeah, basketball, I, I enjoyed watching it, but also you enjoy everybody's an armchair GM, right? You're, sure. Everybody wants, they're a fan of a team. What's that team going to do? Can they get better? Can they trade for this guy? What What are the options here? And all that was documented um, nowhere. You just could not find that stuff. If you wanted to look up the rules of the game, you know, the size of the court, the height of the rim, what's a legal defense, everything else, you could find that stuff. You want the rules, can this team make this trade? 
it's nowhere. So in, in growing up, in becoming, you know, my degree is in computer science, and I, and as a computer scientist, a lot of the ecosystem is populated by people donating FAQs to mm-hmm. it on their area of expertise. And I literally was looking for an FAQ on the CBA. I was involved in, um, it, it's a system called Usenet, which does, I mean, I guess it kind of exists. Google owns it, but Usenet was the internet communications medium way back, like this is before websites, right? Because I'm old. And it, it, think of it like Reddit, but much, much less polite, <laughs> where there's a, there's a group and a topic on everything you can possibly imagine. And way back then at the time, it was populated by people who were like the experts in the field. Like, like um, I saw the movie like Hunt for Red October, and then I started reading Tom Clancy novels. And it, on Usenet, there was a group for Tom Clancy novels. One of the participants was Tom Clancy. <laughs> that, that's the level of stuff that you would get into in stuff like this. There was a robust discussion area on the NBA in general. There was another one, the Lakers and the Knicks and a few other things. And... I, I became a participant in that, and it's a lot of arguing, and you got to know your stuff, uh-huh. and you got to you know be able to debate, you got to be able to fend off trolls and do everything else. But you start to gain a particular set of knowledge, and mine just turned out to be this. Maybe it was because I was like a huge Jerry West fan growing up, right? It's the Lakers, and he became the GM of the Lakers, and the guy's doing these kinds of deals. It's like, well, how does this work? And the first thing I realized is, well, first of all, the information's nowhere. Okay. Second thing is everybody else who's writing about it, they don't know what they're talking about either. I would read newspapers or even these brand new fangled websites coming up and they would write about stuff and this that's not right. You know, this is wrong. This is contradictory. This is, they clearly don't have any idea what they they want. So I decided to be the guy who would... You decided to become the guy. I decided to become the guy who would collect that information and do an FAQ. The idea of an FAQ... I didn't originate that. Someone right. else had already done it. There was a first attempt. It was like two pages long. Half the answers were, I don't know. But it, it was the bones of the thing. And I decided, okay, let's do this right. And I did a brain dump. I assembled a group of people from Usenet to help like fact check me and collaborate and help build this information. I got it up to like 30 pages of stuff pretty quickly. And then it's, okay, in, in getting it down, you realize, okay, there's holes here, holes here, holes here. All this information that we just don't know just by putting down what we do know. So we start reaching out to people. Uh, first person that we talked to was Rich Cho, who was uh, one of the directors of the Sonics at the time. And he answered some of our questions, pointed us in the right direction for stuff, and said, you need to be talking to the league you need, to, you need to go to the, the legal department of the league office. They're the ones who do the CBA. Talk to them. So we start cold calling them. And you were, you were how old at this time? Oh, God, I don't know. This is like 20. This is 1999. Okay. So, yeah, it was like 60 at the time. <laughs> now, I, I do want to ask before you go on. Oh, like, yeah, because I, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of proud of myself. My longest answer to a podcast question, I was timed, 17 minutes. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm going to try and beat that I'm kind of proud today. of myself for that one. At some point, I'm going to let you beat that time. But I do want to try to get an understanding for, like, I understand the inspiration behind it. Was there an aha moment where you're sitting there on the message boards and you thought, you know what, guys? You know what would be brilliant is if we if we made an FAQ or if we compiled all this information or if... if you know, what was that aha moment? Do you remember? You know, brilliant idea. I'm not, not saying that's oh, this is a brilliant idea, right? But you look back in retrospect and this idea that develops slowly over time. And then it's like, oh, of course it's that. Yeah. You know, we're looking in retrospect. It looks completely different than during the process. It wasn't an inspirational eureka moment for me. Okay. It, it was, okay, this kind of slowly like developed over time and became a thing. Yeah. And so you're saying you, you put together a group of uh, a group of buddies of and started working on of this? Used that, yeah, we, okay. yeah, yeah, we reached out to the league office. One of the guys was, was a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch right across the street from the league office. Okay. So he walked over, got the CBA. And it, as it turns out, the CBA was publicly available. Nobody ever asked the league for it except the occasional law school student mm-hmm. who was doing some kind of research thing. And they were kind of curious, well, what would you possibly want this for? 
explained it to them. We became friends with them. And as it turns out that once they kind of realized what we were doing and that we were kind of serious about it and we weren't, you know, just a bunch of goof offs who were going to do a bad job representing what they do, they were into it. They mm -hmm. were, you know, more than willing to help out with stuff. And I've developed a long term friendship with some of the people in the league office that continues to this day. But able to get questions answered, get the CBA itself, read it, read it again read it a third time, and I answered a lot of those open questions that I still had. Now, let me ask you, you said you read it, you read it again, and then you read it again. So by my count, that's at least three times. At least, start. yeah. Where does that come from? Like, I get that you were a fan, right? You're a Jerry West fan, you're a Lakers fan, but like, where did that passion come from? That's a good question. I mean, I'm, I've always been a fastidious person about stuff like this. Um, in, like in becoming a computer scientist, I, at the time, personal computers weren't available. Mm -hmm. you, you kids out there, yeah, collect yourself. We would have to go somewhere else to use a computer, and I just was able to do that at a local college and like became fascinated and just dove right into the thing and, and taught myself computer science before I ever went to school for it. Or, and that's what got me jobs in the field was, was being able to do that directly. Mm -hmm. I'm just the kind of person who I, I, I dive into stuff when I, when I get into it, and I... I see how far it can go. Yeah, I mean, you've definitely seen that. So, so we were, um, I answered all the questions, but there were still so many open questions and there was just a lot of talking to the league because it's, it's amazing in reason, reading the CBA, how much stuff it is there, but it's mixed in how it's written, not what's written right. in different things across different sections. It's, it's brilliantly written, but it's written for, their their breakdown of it in their heads and how that documents things which i mean there could be some crossover for me i say that as a computer scientist your job is communication your job is saying things in a clear and unambiguous way mm -hmm. sometimes it's writing computer software you're saying things in a clear and unambiguous way to a computer so it can follow your instructions correctly and do you know that bank transfer actually happens but sometimes you're writing a legal contract and you're trying to say things clear and unambiguously for the next lawyer who comes along who reads that contract. There's a lot of crossover in that, in being able to take something and organize it and put it down in a clear fashion. And I think that helped me. People say, okay, you think like a lawyer. I don't think so. I think I think more like a scientist than, mm -hmm. than a lawyer. But again, there's a lot of bleed over to that. Yeah, so we got the questions answered eventually. I finally came out with the CBA in 1999 with the 99 collective bargaining agreement. Mm -hmm. And it my Did it take off immediately? Slowly. It's it's a very slow ramp up. My um, my intended audience was three. One was me. One was other fans on Usenet or wherever who mm -hmm. wanted to understand this stuff because I'm out there looking for this. I assume there's got to be at least a couple of other people out there in the world who want to know this kind of thing. And then the third was people in the media where I was reading stuff going, that's not right. So when I would see them write something that I now knew was wrong, I would email them, write to them, just politely say, hey, just so you know, you wrote this. That's not exactly accurate. Um, this is the way the rule works. And just so you know, there's this FAQ out there now that you can fact check with. Brilliant. Yeah. And it was almost over 99.9% 99 .9 overwhelmingly well received because, okay. hey, here's some guy out there helping us do our job better, providing me a reference to use. Great. So they would start relying on it and, and work would get better. Then they would start quoting it directly. Then they would start quoting me directly. And so again, this is kind of ramping up. And the dam actually broke in, I think it was 2009, where Howard Beck, who was with the New York Times at the time, wrote an article in the Times about me and just this whole thing that I do. And it just kind of exploded at that point. So 10 years later? 10 years later, yeah. Okay. Well, this is one of those things. Kids, if you want to break into sports, you do something, you do it well, you do it for no money whatsoever. In fact, when people offer you things, you turn them down flat. You say, no, this is for the art. This is for the personal 
pleasure of doing it. This is not for any kind of money whatsoever. You do that, you can build a great career. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there's a powerful lesson there with what you just said when you just outlined like the product you created was really to scratch your own itch, right? You didn't really care whether or not anybody else liked it other than your Usenet buddies. It was, you thought that it was something that needed to be created. You created it and it just so happened that there was a huge market out there for people who are interested. Yeah. And then as it turned out, I accidentally did it well enough that people used it way beyond what I had ever intended. Right. So people who are actually did this for a living in the league started using it. And so there's kind of two parallel tracks that started happening here at this point. One was doing writing directly. So after the, the, the Times article, um, pretty soon after that, they were starting up some stuff. They asked me to come write for them. Mm-hmm. Right. And then it's Jonathan Abrams, um, who was also with the Times at the time, gave me the offer. And I had to think for about a half a second about, gee, write for the New York Times. OK. Right. So I, I started doing doing them, and then um, Royce Webb from ESPN got a hold of me, and we, we talked on and off for a while, but eventually I came over and started um, being one of the ESPN team and writing for them directly. So the whole writing thing was one avenue of it, and I, I like doing it. It's just not a very time-effective thing for me, so I, I don't really write that much anymore. Then the other half of it is the whole teaching, consulting, all that stuff, where, um, like I said, I was surprised that people actually working in the league, if you're working for a team, why the hell would you want this? I, I, it just shocked me because you have the league office. Yeah, You can call up the lawyers who wrote the freaking thing. Why are you doing this? But my, my favorite story, and I've told this like on every podcast, so you've probably already heard it already, but one team told me that when, whenever they had an open question, they would kind of split into thirds, the GM and the two assistant GMs. One would call the league office and look, ask them for the answer. One would go to the CBA and one would go to my FAQ. And the challenge was to see who would come back first with the correct answer. <laughs> Love that. And because I tell the anecdote, you know who won. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yeah, the, the person who, who actually looked it up in the CBA was not the guy who came back with the answer first in the majority of cases. No, I mean, it's definitely a very dense and heavy document. How many, how many words in the current CBA? God, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hundreds of pages, though. So Hundreds of pages, right? Yeah. So right now, I mean, how do you, for anybody who's interested, right, even when, we, when people go to your site, it's a fantastic site. It's clean. It's got all the information there. It's still a lot of information to, to retain. Right. Do you have any suggestions for people who want to, you know, really understand the CBA, how they should go about studying it? Well, the ultimate answer is you should take sports business classroom, but we'll get to that later. Yes, sure. you are. For me, it's always well. And here's here's the other thing. I'm going to tell the next part of the story okay. before I answer that question, because it's going to lead into that answer for you. As soon as the CBA FAQ was out there, I immediately became the answer guy for the entire freaking world. Right, because they're reading stuff, they want to know stuff. Oh, go ask this guy. So I would get a lot of emails, especially early on in the process. I would get a ton of emails from people um, just asking various questions to them. Some of them are just, you know, read it. It's right there, dude. You know, in the FAQ, question number six or whatever. But some of them are pretty tough questions that I didn't know the answer to. And I would have to either do research or even go ask the league about. And Mm -hmm. some of them were head scratchers even for the league. But you want to be able to learn something really, really well. You know, they say teach it to others, right? Mm-hmm. This, you know, answer these questions. Every edge case that everybody in the world comes up with who's interested in this stuff, answer every single one of those questions for years. You're going to get pretty good. So that's that's kind of what happened, and that's kind of where the expertise deepened. You know, when I first did the the FAQ, I had, you know, maybe the level of knowledge of a, of an agent who knew this stuff pretty well. Now it's kind of, you know, up there. I wouldn't put myself equal to like a Dan Rube at the league office who wrote the thing and really knows the, all the legal and philosophical underpinnings of every single word, every single dot in, in the CBA. But I, well enough that I know it better than team people, certainly. 
Now, have you had conversations with the gentleman about, uh, you know, just the wording he used, the philosophy? Oh, yeah, all the I mean, we used to talk all the time. Now, we we have an annual dinner at Summer League uh, where we just get together and the the topics will vary. And sometimes let's talk about our kids and never, never get off that subject. Sometimes, you know, or it's like the year before. Um, the 2017 CBA comes out. It's like the philosophical things about what's going to happen in the next agreement and, and the motivations back and forth and things like that. But yeah, sometimes this is like, okay, what the hell were you thinking there? One time I was told, uh, because I was confused by, by this rule, and I'm like, okay, what, what is this saying? And then he tells me, I'm going, no, 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 no. And I read it to him. And he goes, yeah, you're reading it right, but you're stressing the wrong words. Wow. Like, okay, where do you go with stuff like that, right? But that's the kind of thing where if you, to get that level of really understanding where it's coming from, that's I, I had the best possible mentor for that. Yeah, no question. I think that, uh, so Nate Duncan, has, he had an interesting path as far as how he he came to really learn the CBA, right? Uh-huh. I, mean, I think, didn't he create flashcards? He created but, a set of flashcards as his own learning device, and that's what worked for him. Yeah. Oh, but okay, now I'm going to go back and answer that question before you move on to this one. I'm kind of operating a question behind you right now, Sergio. For somebody who wants to learn this stuff, yeah, you can do stuff like flashcards. I think that, and I'm trying to do this in some of the stuff we do with SBC, I'll explain it, but go look it up in the CBA itself. Figure you, I'll say something that could be spread among a bunch of different places in the CBA or written in this obtuse manner that I want you to go in there and parse out to really see how it's written to get that understanding so that when you have your own question, what's this? Well, you know how to look it up in the CBA. You know how to navigate that document, read what's there, and answer that question for yourself. And it's in answering that, okay, what about, what about, what about, type of activity that really deepens your understanding of something. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated document, that's for sure. But uh, And so that's what you teach at SBC, right? Yeah, so SBC, I wanted to first of all make it a little bit more rigorous academically. Mm-hmm. So organized it like a college, where everybody who goes to college, you're gonna take some GE, general education, get a little breath, a little bit of everything. But you're gonna pick a major, and you're gonna dive in deep. and. Let's, let's pick out the right majors, and obviously the salary cap is going to be one of them. So I would give you give every student um, some introduction to the salary cap, some just high-level stuff in the GE sections, and then if you chose to be a salary cap major, we're going to dive in deep and get into a lot of stuff. By then, I'd already been teaching it to teams, so I just took the curriculum I was doing for teams, took enough of that to get like nine hours of content, and we made that the, the major for, C, for sports business classroom. Scouting video analytics was the second one that was inherited from before. We were doing broadcasting. We were doing social media. Um, we kind of consolidated that over time. But that first year, and I'm not sure we didn't have that many students, but that first year became kind of the framework for doing this. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because then I take what I did with SBC and I make the the curriculum for the the teams better and that helps make SBC better so I get that nice little circular and both improve each other Um, and then we've just evolved SBC over time okay this major works better than that one I want to take feedback keep improving it um, bring in different things every time like not this year but last year I, I had more of like a legal emphasis the year before that I had more of like a journalistic emphasis and we had Andrea Kramer come in and talking about doing interviews and pumping sources, stuff like that. So I think we keep making it better and better, but it's it's really evolved into a, a thing where you can come in, if you're interested in learning the CBA, you come in, not only do you get all the benefits around SBC, but you're getting that direct instruction that's exactly what I teach to teams when I when I teach it to front offices. Right, no, I mean, and, and you've done a fantastic job with Thank SBC. You. And really, as far as past teachers go for SBC, it's really a who's who in the sports business world. I mean, we've got Mark Cuban, Kurt Goldsberry, uh, George Raveling, Woj, Adam Silver, Tommy Shepard. I mean, the, the list goes on. Yeah, and at different levels of involvement too, right? So some of them, like Adam Silver, okay, that was 
not only was it he a drop in guest, but it was just complete happenstance that we happened to get him. Where, I remember. Yeah, because we we just happened to be in a room that was kind of behind where the the court area is in the Thomas and Mac, and I'm waiting for Daryl Morey to come in and do a, an, a lecture on analytics. I'm like so I go out and he's running late because the game's running late. So I go out to the arena to kind of scan for him. Look, okay, look for Daryl. Where's Daryl? And there's Adam Silver sitting there at the corner of the court. So I just kind of walk over and say, you know, hey to, to his media guy who's always with him, and just say, hey, I got, I got a room full of students just on the other side of that wall. Can we get Adam? And um, he goes, oh yeah, okay. You know, he's got to do this. He's got to like talk to these people. He's got to talk to this owner, and then then he's available. So just then, Warren Legary, um, who's the the executive director of the summer league, comes like walks by. I go, Warren. I got Adam, he's gonna come in. He goes, great, when? I said, well, he's gotta do this and he's gotta do this. And, he, and Warren goes, eh, <laughs> walks up, interrupts him, goes, Adam, you know Larry, right? He goes, yeah, I know Larry, how you doing, Larry? And and Warren goes, Adam, go talk to his students. <laughs> so he goes, lead the way. And so I, I, I walk him back, you know, burst through the door, jaws drop, so we have Adam as the dropping guest. So that's like the happenstance, and I always try to get a number of good dropping guests every year, and you know, guys like Zach Lowe come in, um, and and um, Jackie McMullen has come in and done stuff. I get various GMs, RC Buford's come in and done stuff, but then there's like the the sort of the next level up is the panelists, right? I try to get a good. I, don't, I try not to teach predominantly through panels, just because it's not the best way to learn. Mm -hmm. It's the best way to get additional perspective. So I tend to wrap up topics with panels. So like for the job stuff, we'll get Professor Jeff Fellinser, who I know has been a guest on this podcast before. Um, we'll get him in to teach all the stuff about um, resume writing and networking and elevator pitches and interviewing and everything like that. And then we'll wrap it up with some people who are working in the league and doing different things and talk like give that perspective on multiple people. We'll do a, a, a panel on podcasts and we'll get in we did that this past year. We get in people who've done podcasts at different levels, you know, like Nate, who's really grassroots. We got Howard Beck. Yes, it was this very insular thing. We always use our friends. Um, who's done it, who does it for like a bigger organization, just to get those kinds of different perspectives. So that's like the next level. Just come in, sit down, be a part of a panel. I have favorites that I will use year after year for like the CBA panel and things like that. Then the, the level above that would be you're delivering a one-hour lecture for us. So Daryl Morey always does that. Kirk Goldsberry always does that for us. A, a few other people who are coming in and they have their thing that they do and let's let's give a solid hour of this. And then there's the people who, okay, like you're brilliant and you know what you're doing and you're great at communicating this stuff and come in here and just lead this, this whole section or teach this entire um, thing. So like a Wes Wilcox, who was the GM of the Atlanta Hawks, came in and he, you know, he, I first asked him to do the introductory lecture on scouting. And he goes, okay, there's all that. But then there's like, there's all this team stuff around that. that he wanted to give you more. That, yeah. So it's like, okay, well, now it's two lectures. And we had him doing that. And then we had him doing the practicum. We had him doing um, some uh, more deep lectures in the deep dive in the major part of that. So Wes was all over the program this year and he was just fantastic. Yeah, he's great. He's great. And all the guests are great. And to be honest with you, I mean, I never actually get to sit in it in any of the lectures. Well, I'd have but, to charge you. <laughs> and I, I'm always super jealous. <laughs> honest to God, I'm always looking at the roster and thinking, man, I could sneak away from my duties from summer league for a little bit and mm -hmm. go, go check out this lecture. But, uh, you know, the guests are phenomenal. You know, that, I'm curious, like, what have you learned from the guests? Like, are, is there anybody in particular that has said anything that's really impacted you? Oh, God. Um, so, it, sadly, first of all, I don't get to attend a lot of the, the things that I wish I could attend, either because it's the major stuff and the majors are going in parallel. Mm -hmm. So I'm teaching. I can't, I can't be listening into some of the scouting video analytics deep dive stuff that I'd really love to get, although you know we're taping those, so um, I go back later and, and listen to some of them. But, um, or even when it's just the single track, because we're in the still, we're still in the GE. I'm running around. You know what it's like. Yeah, I'm you're running working, around yeah. like crazy, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And even if uh, it, there's no 
nothing on fire right then where I just have to deal with something right away. I'm still, if there's games going on, I'm going to go do a lap around the court and just to see if there's somebody I can dig up to come in and be a popping guest. And I've had some great popping, you know, like R.C. Buford yeah. was just, hey, when are you going to have me in your class? <laughs> How about right now? Right, come on down. <laughs> come on down, yeah. yeah. And, and that's how stuff like that happens. Um, other things are, uh, like one of my favorite panels has always been the CBA panel. I get like two of two of my favorite guys in the league are Tommy Shepard, who's now the GM of the Washington Wizards. The good and, man. Yeah, and, and Pete D'Alessandro, who's been the GM of, Den of Sacramento. He's been in the Denver organization. Now he's the assistant GM in Orlando. And they're both good friends. They're both great guys. And the conversations about the life with them. Um, about the life. The, the life. The life of being a guy working in the league. And what it really means on a day-to-day -day basis. Or what, you know, talking about, like, okay, if you got to fire somebody. Okay, there's like, you know, a little ticker coming up on the screen on, on Sports Center. You know, this team fires this coach. Well, that coach just fired him, fired his family, <laughs> you know, right. fired his kids. Uh, all this stuff that, that people never really, you know, really understand fully. I mean, Pete, when he got the job in Orlando, um, he was getting, um, there, there were texts coming in from people who had seen it breaking in the news. And he, he was going to get his kid from school that day. He was texting all the other parents and saying, please don't tell my son, you know, please tell your kids, don't tell my son about this. Because wow. he wanted to be the one to tell them, We're, we got to move. Wow. That's the kind of stuff where the, so all those little stories like that, those are the ones that impact you. I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, it, it humanizes them too, uh -huh. right? You realize they're just people. You know, they're just people. So, well, yeah, not only that, but they're they're great people, right? They're fantastic they're, they're, people, <laughs> right? So, the, there's nobody around the league. I don't, uh, you know, some of them I just think are some of the best people I've ever met. But everybody's sharp, everybody's dedicated, you know, because look look at this rarefied atmosphere that we're working in, right? In the NBA, you can pick and choose the best of the best of the best. Yeah. And if somebody wants to break into the league, and this is starting to segue into what people can do yeah. uh, who, who want to do that, they're able to pick and choose exactly what they want. You yeah. know, with the, the we're going to open up a job to be the guy making the airport runs. Okay, we're going to get six guys with PhDs who want to get a foot in the door. Yeah, no question. So I do want to ask, I mean, you, you've had how many students now over the years at SBC? Close to, so that's close to 200. What would you say is the most common question that comes up? Um, other than the, the... How do I get a job? Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, than the regular procedural ones. Um, I, I think a lot of the ones where people kind of don't know, because they're, they're not sure of their footing and their standing where they are in the moment. Because what we try to do with SBC, okay, yeah, we can bring you anywhere. Anybody can bring a bunch of people in there and teach the academics, mm -hmm. right? Okay, I'm not the only one who can or does teach CBA stuff. I'm not certainly not the only one who could hire someone to teach scouting really well or, or video or analytics, things like that, um, or, or the basic job skills. But what we try to do is take advantage of the setting that we're in. We are part and parcel of the summer league, thanks to you guys, where um, we're in the arena. Nobody else can be in the arena. We are able to take the best of summer league. Everybody from, okay, Adam Silver, but more importantly, the day-to-day -day working guys. Not mm -hmm. the GMs, okay, Talk to the assistant GMs, bring them in, talk about their daily life, right? Because if you're going to get a job in the league, there's only a few GMs out there. Okay, There's one third as many G NBA GMs as there are U.S. senators. Right. Okay. You're, you're three times more likely to be sitting in the Senate than just by pure numbers than you are to be at the head of an NBA team. So we're getting the working people in there, the the media people. Um, we're getting the the social people media people in there, which is like one of the huge areas for, for jobs, right? Analytics people, the scouts, the video coordinators, all of those kinds of guys in there to work with you, you know, to talk to you, to work with you directly. One thing we did this year 
um, was to set people up with one-on-one sessions with those kinds of people where, what are you interested in talking to? Do you mm-hmm. want an agent? Do you want a basketball ops person? Do you want a media person? Do you want whatever? I gave them like 12 different categories and I would set them up with one-on-ones with people who were doing what they were interested in doing. So that kind of immersion, but also we're putting you out there on the floor in the summer league doing various jobs. You're sitting in the scans in the stands scouting a game with the scout where the scout is showing you, okay, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm putting down. This is the the kinds of things I'm paying attention to or not paying attention to for the different kinds of scouting that are out there. Video coordinator is showing you how he's going to cut a game. And we're kind of taking you to that process. And then, so it's like, okay, here's how to scout. Now go sit in the stands with the scout and scout a game. Come back. Here's how to do video. Let's let's take that game and and let's code it and come up with things that are going to answer certain questions. And now you're going to go out to the stands the next day and you're going to do your own scouting on stuff. So that kind of immersion in the summer league is really where a lot of the benefit happens. But in in addition to being immersed and working in the league, it's also network city, right? Because sure. everything, as you know very well, right? This is a small, tight-knit community that everybody wants to break into. And you have to be able to demonstrate, you know, we'll talk about all the attributes, you know, demonstrating value and all that, but you got to know people. And more importantly, they have to know you. How do you get there? How do you get that one step from, I am in the league doing something in sports business classroom to, I am networking with a guy who is a decision maker for a team who wants to, who I want to know me and get him so that he is interested in me. And if I just send him a resume, it's not gonna be one of a thousand resumes that come in. Well, that kind of networking is sort of that that next step that we help people make. And the questions, I'm still answering that original question, the questions that come in are, are more about, okay, well, how am I doing this kind of thing? Because that's where they're just not quite sure of their footing. Yeah, no, and that's definitely something I know Jeff kind of, um, Jeff Fallenser, who's on the podcast earlier this year, he, um, I think he speaks about a little bit about that, about resume writing, networking, and mm-hmm. different ways to approach people. But just about everybody that's been on this podcast so far has basically said that relationships, I mean, your skills are important, but if you don't have the relationships in sports, it's just, it's it's really not going to happen. Well, and if you are, okay, if you have the skills, you can have a, a PhD in analytics, and you're going to be one of a thousand resumes that come in the door for that kind of position opening up. And maybe it's not even that kind of position, like I said. Maybe it's just the guy at the bottom rung of the ladder who's making coffee every morning and doing whatever. But that's your foot in the door, right? So if you're interested in getting a job in the league, don't don't start off with a filter, right? Don't be, oh, I got to be in this city or I got to be at this this pay or, oh, I've got to, I'm looking at this kind of job. You take what you can take to get in the door right. because your first job is not about that job. That's about starting to build your own repertoire to be able to, to move on and get that next job. And then the job after that and then the job after that. Maybe five or six jobs down the line, you're going to get to where you want to go. And the people maybe. who, maybe, right? And the people who get there. But the people who do make it, like looking at it from the other way, those are the guys who work their way up, right? Unless you were, unless you were a player, okay? So yeah. that, that's one quick way <laughs> right into right to the front of the line, okay? Sure. Um, and there's a few people, like some of the most successful agents turn out to be, you know, the Bob Myers types of people can, can get a little bit of a shortcut in. But most of the other people are working their way up, right? Yeah. Sam Presti, right? Intern in San Antonio. Well, freaking everybody was an intern in San Antonio. I took a tour through the San Antonio front office. And they like go into this one room, it's like a little closet, but the whole wall of video equipment there. And points to the chair and goes, half the GM is in the league sat right there in that chair. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you've, you've, you've got to figure out how you're going to get in, how you're going to start to build that network. You know, what we do at SBC is we're not saying, okay, you come here and then, it, you know, it's like we're not like a, a college where we've prepared you, now go out and get a job and you're going to be able to find one, right? This is rarefied atmosphere. You're looking to break into something that very few people break into. 
without us, you're like one in a thousand for a job maybe. Yeah. Well, we're going to make your odds a lot better than that. But then it's kind of up to you, right? You have to help yourself. You, you, have, to you help have to help yourself. To help yourself. We'll, we'll set it up for you. We put you in that environment. We immerse you in it. We teach, we teach you. We immerse you. We kind of advise you, help you. But you still got to be one of the people who are going to take that next step yourself and get there. Right. And just to paint that picture, as far as guests who have just been on this podcast, okay, Jay Kelfer drove out to the summer league uninvited uh-huh. and basically worked his way he onto the internet. still can't get staff. him to leave, can you? Couldn't get him to leave. All right. Shay Dawson was a 32-year-old intern for uh-huh. us. Okay. Got her foot in the door. Never left. Has been running, you know, has been uh, crushing it ever since. Uh-huh. Dennis Rogers. Okay said that when he was trying to get a job in any sport in the United States, that he sent handwritten notes to every single pro sports team uh-huh. before he got a response. Okay, And then Albert Hall's podcast is coming out pretty soon. Like He's got an incredible story too. But the point is, is that everybody's had to go through somewhat drastic measures to get to where they want to go, right? You created the CBA FAQ out of absolutely nowhere. Yeah. 10 years later, right? Ten, ten, yeah. Well, well, first of all, it's much easier to be number one in a field of one. True. Right. So I happened to kind of create that whole thing, and that was my entree into it. Oh, okay, so complete, something completely new, bring that value with something nobody else has done. People are going to pay attention to that, and that makes it easier. Is everybody going to be able to do that? No. But... Find the lane that not everybody is driving down. Now, did right? you know when, when you created this thing, obviously you knew that it was unique, but did you have any idea where it could potentially lead you? Oh, or God, no. Absolutely none. No. Yeah. I mean, because I'm, I wasn't trying to break into the league. I, that just wasn't my, I, I'm a computer scientist. I have a day job. That's my career. There are certain rewards and advantages to having a long-lived career at a major university, and I was perfectly fine treading down that path. And but I always do stuff on the side that keeps me interested. Mm-hmm. You know, like we mentioned teaching, and I've done, did that for a while. There's other various things that I always do, and this was just one of those things that, yeah, this kind of took a life of its own beyond what I had wanted to do. And then once it got to that point where okay, I could work in the league. You know, people have talked to me about working in the league and other people have said, yeah, let me know. I'll get you a job wherever you want to go type of thing. Um, Even when it got to that point, you know, if I was in my 20s at the time and willing to just, okay, pack up and go anywhere, I would have done it, but I was farther along in my life. I have a kid, you know, my wife is, and I are established in one place. I don't want to leave the weather here. Yeah, For whatever reason, you know, I, I, I kind of preferred dabbling in it i i just say it's this is my hobby it's a lucrative hobby and and a very involved hobby but it's still it it really is a hobby for me how much time were you putting in on in on the nights when you were working on this thing oh well when i first started the the funny thing is that first brain dump um that i i wrote down what was the basis for the faq my daughter was just born and i was spending a lot of time at home and you know this, young kids, fortunately, well, they'll sleep for a while. Mm-hmm. Not at the times you want them to sleep. But they sleep a lot. But, but they mm-hmm. sleep a lot. So if, if my wife is working and I'm home with my daughter and she's zonked out for three hours, well, I'm going to st- you know, work on this for three hours. Yeah. And over time, yeah, that just got put together. It didn't take that much work to actually hammer this out. The, the the start of that and then the research after that was just time here to you know lunchtime or whatever just call somebody so it just got kind of put together with a couple of hours a, a day here and there and the the hard parts are when yes yeah, like okay i've got it like spc okay we start working as you know very well we start working in spc around january and then it starts to you know it just sort of ramps up through February, March, April, May, and into June. And between organizing all the guests and all the everything else that goes around the facilities and and everything you have to order, buses, catering, et cetera, et cetera, and getting students registered and 
shaking them and getting them to pay and yeah, everything uh, it's else. A lot of, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah, it's it's just a ton. So yeah, this hobby of mine has become a monster. But it's it's this is what I like. I like you take I on like big diving. hobbies. I take on big hobbies. I love that. Now Rick, I want to go back to the CBA a little bit, right? You 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 consult for teams, right? You do SBC. You're you're frequently doing media. Like, what does your media digest look like right now so that when you do have to do a media appearance, you're ready to go with the latest news on whatever player it might be and how that correlates to the CBA? Yeah, I, I'm not the best at that part of it. So you, I mean, if, you sound great whenever you're on you're on well, TV yeah, on the radio. You. A lot of it is oh, is cramming right at the last yeah, minute. I yeah. do have to say, because just because of the amount of time I have, I don't watch as much basketball as I used to. Right. If I don't go to a game, then I tend not to watch it on TV because if I'm home doing something, I'm working on something. Yeah. So I have to like go to a game to watch basketball. Um, I know it's a problem that like a lot of this is a total first world problem. I know, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I don't see it as much as I would like to people like Nate Duncan yeah. will watch most of the games that happen. And in addition to have, so if you want someone who's able to blend that with the people in the league to say right at this moment, okay, here's what's going on with that. Nate's a better guy at that. Eric Pincus is a better guy at that because they spend more of their time actually watching the games and keeping current than I do. I'm more of like a theorist where I, I have the rules down and if I need to talk about something, especially one thing is that I have two super busy periods, the trade deadline and free agency. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thanks, the summer league coincides with free agency, so I have to, I don't get much sleep like around the 1st of July. But then I'm, I'm pretty current, but most of the rest of the time, if you're asking me about stuff that's going on now, well, okay, I'm going to go to a game tomorrow. I'll figure out then like, what I'm looking at. Yeah, no, it's always, I mean, every time I, I hear you speak, I'm like, where does he find the time to, you know, to research all that information and connect that with what, you know, with what you already knew. It's, it's, it's brilliant stuff. But you mentioned you don't get much sleep like during summer league, right. And during the, during uh, um, the trade deadline, I mean, you don't sleep much anyways, right? Can you tell the audience what time you usually wake up? Uh, yeah, I don't set an alarm. I just wake up when I wake up, but that's usually four-ish. So, I'm, so I've always been curious. We've talked about this before, about the four o'clock wake up time, and I've tried it. And I encourage everybody to try it. Well, first it is off, extremely if you, difficult. If you, if you try it, then it's already self-defeating, right? Very it's, true. It's just, it happens when it happens. And that's just what time I, I tend to get up. But then sort of that four o'clock to five o'clock thing, that's just kind of okay if i want to uh, like i don't i try not to answer emails during that time because then I, it's starting to like get into work and stuff yeah when i like want to browse around watch something on youtube or do something like that just just surf websites and stuff that's when i'll do that okay um that's just kind of my own quiet time to do whatever and then i'll start rolling out and, and starting to pay attention to the day job and I'll what time do you start paying attention to the day job if you can say so publicly? Five ish. Okay. Usually, like usually, I take like the first hour just to just to kind of wake up and do that, and then five ish, I'll start paying attention to stuff. I will look at emails and and start doing stuff, um, and then yeah, roll into work, and then as the work day starts to get chaotic, depending on what kind of day it is, either that's going to be the whole day dealing with stuff at work, or things will start to slow down a little bit. It's like okay, now I can like maybe start um, answering some NBA stuff or things like that. Do you get a bunch of, you get a bunch of questions via email every day or not? How, I, you how, know, how I are you getting to, your questions at this point? I used to get a lot by email. I mean a lot. Yeah. And that kind of died down fortunately because when you have no space limitations in an email, you can ask some pretty involved questions. Sure. <laughs> you prefer Twitter, right? I prefer Twitter, yeah. So Twitter was, was a godsend for me because they'll ask something that I can answer easily and quickly. But it's trying to provide an answer. You don't want to, like people will ask me on Twitter, like somebody will ask us like what people will say, well, that's a dumb question. Why are you asking, asking this obvious question? Because it's not a dumb question to them. And if it's not a dumb question to them, it's probably not a dumb question to another hundred people who happen to read that on my feed as well. Right. So it's going to help them. So I'm trying to answer questions that are going to help 
everybody who's, who might have that question. And I don't assume a baseline level of knowledge of, okay, you've read this, the FAQ or anything like that. You're just a casual fan who stumbled upon me who wants to, oh, I never kind of knew about this whole thing about why can you spend above a salary cap? What's going on here? Things like that. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask you, is it difficult for you to determine what is, you know, a base level question versus versus an advanced question or are you just, hey, you're happy to answer whatever questions you're I'm, Yeah, I'm happy. Now the time I'm able to spend doing that, I, I used to be on Twitter a lot more. Um, I used to have like a on second monitor, I'll just have, have the Twitter feed up and something pops up, I'll answer it, but it's just too distracting. Yeah. So I, I kind of stopped doing that. And if I'm, if I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting, but I'll go days now without without even looking at it. So yeah, and back to questions. I, I read somewhere that you said that you pride yourself on being a logical and critical thinker. There's a philosophical movement called scientific skepticism. And I definitely consider myself to be in that mold. Can you talk about that? I've, I've always been curious exactly what, what, what you meant by that. Well, uh, it kind of goes back to like, you know, thinking like a scientist, mm -hmm. you know, the whole scientific. What does method. that mean for those people who are listening that, you know, may not be scientists, may not have had too much education in, in science? Well, the, yeah, the whole thing is you're, you're trying, th there's some claim, right? Some truth claim, let's say, you know, this is a fact, whether it's whatever, this thing is an effective drug against this disease down to just some political thing or some philosophical thing or just some, some whatever, my wife says something to me, right? Well, there it, it's dealing with things on the basis of evidence, on the basis of having a process for looking at something. Obviously, methodologically, if you're trying to answer a question, is this drug effective, you're going to be much more rigorous than you are if you're just trying to figure out if your wife, wife is lying to you about something. But, <laughs> um, and you're going to be much more forgiving. But um, th there's, it, it's an approach to stuff that's based on evidence, that's based on logic, that's based, but there's also a lot of psychology to it. It's knowing where people are um, how people can be deceived and how they can de deceive themselves. Everything from, you know, and then that gets into things like um, if somebody's trying to sell you something, you're recognizing, oh, they're trying to anchor me. They're trying to do something like this right. to be able to see, to, to see stuff like that or knowing, okay, politically, if you're looking at what's going on now, okay, you're looking at this, this argument versus this argument, knowing the logical fallacies that people can apply, the, the bad forms of argumentation, and you can... Sp one thing is getting into skepticism makes it so that you're a real pain in the ass to people who don't agree with you because you see the holes and stuff, you know, like that. And it's like, no, don't give me that. You know, this is this. And, you know, you, you're you're kind of like, don't don't even bring that to the table. So now, have you always been like this or did you read a book? I, or, I or, think or, to various perspectives, the levels. Yeah. Um, and it's been an approach that I've taken, but also, yeah, I mean, my brother's a psychologist and I've just kind of gleaned an interest in psychology from that. And then you get into things like, okay, where, where does thinking go wrong? Um, the, you know, there are good books on that and the podcasts on that. Um, and I, I really do enjoy that. So there's, there's podcasts I listen to every week on skepticism. Anything you want to recommend? Well, like the or? Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, I think, is the, the best one. Okay, fantastic. So how much do you read? Um, not, well, I mean, depending if uh, you could say I read all day at work. Right. Um, I mean, either reading or writing or talking, you know, sure. eight to ten hours a day. How much do you office. read for pleasure, would you say? I don't think it's all that much. It takes me a while to get through. Like, I... I Picked up the ebook of of Gladwell the day it came out, which was a couple of weeks ago, and I'm maybe a third of the way through it. So, when I have a few moments of spare time, I'll sit down and pop it open and and read a few pages. But what about other books? Are there any other favorite books? Books that have molded your thinking? Books that you think that everybody should read? You know, do you have do you have any suggestions for the well, audience? Well, it's funny because just on the line of like how to to evaluate what people are saying, you know, how how to 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 treat truth claims. My favorite book ever was um, The Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan okay. Um, which is sort of the, it, it's now a little bit long in the tooth, but, and The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe kind of is, is the more modern version of that. But Sagan was just such a brilliant writer and such a brilliant thinker um, that that's the, the one book that I recommend to, to everybody. 
Um, and then you like lighter reading. You know, like, like I love reading Malcolm Gladwell. The book I'm reading right now is his new one. Yeah. Um, talking to strangers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I'm, uh, I haven't jumped into that, but we'll, we'll include all those, all those books in the show notes so that you guys can check them out. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, he's not, you know, he's more of a social, you know, it's not a rigorous presentation of anything, but it's it, for light reading and really approachable and presentable. You know, can you argue with what he's saying? Of course you can, but it's a great narrative. Well, of course you can. <laughs> so I want to shift gears a little bit. So, Larry, tell me a little bit about the future of Sports Business Classroom. What do we have in the pipeline? Well, first of all, the one-week Vegas experience continues to be the backbone of Sports Business Classroom. That's where you get the best of everything, right? Mm-hmm. Not only do you get the curriculum, you get the immersion. You get, you know, you're going to be networking with the people that you're going to want jobs from. If if you're interested in learning this stuff, even if you're like an agent or somebody who, who wants to learn this CBA more, we offer the executive session as part of that, where you can come in and just get that if you're already working in the league in some capacity. But Sports Business Classroom is is a commitment, right? You've got to uh, come to Vegas. You have to be willing to spend a week. You have, to, you have to be available then. It's a financial commitment. It's the, There's a lot around that. You can't beat that for what it is, but there are also people who always ask for, I, I want the, the CBA knowledge. So we're trying to give that to you, right? Not everybody can have me come in and teach it to them directly, but we're looking at doing a video version of this where we are taping CBA lessons that are based on my curriculum mm-hmm. and with exercises and with all sorts of value add around that. And you're going to be able to come in, get the videos and learn it from me through the videos. On demand? On demand. Wow, that sounds phenomenal. And on top of that, I mean, the truth of the matter is Sports Business Classroom in Vegas sells out every year. Right. And yes, this is this is a fantastic attempt to try and reach more people. And even if we open it up for more people, it still sells out. So, yeah, no, I mean, we have we have a very long waiting list at this mo- at this point. So, well, part of it also is I don't want to dilute the experience for people. So right. I'm very careful about how many people we let in there to make it so that if we bring people and you're going to be able to talk to people, you're going to be able to network, you're going to be able to go out into the schmooze pit or into the stands with people and you're not one of 60 SBC students who are vying for somebody's attention. This has got to be an experience where you have access to me, you have access to asking questions and and a dialogue with anybody who's teaching. You have the ability to go out there and actually be doing something where you're not one of five people doing it and also networking with the people in the league. So that, by definition, keeps our student size small. I can't just open it up for anybody to come in because then that's not as good of an experience for anybody. No, and it's really all about the experience. And, you know, you've been able to interact with a lot of different kids um, during SBC. I'm curious, what what makes somebody stand out to you? What makes somebody special in, in the program? I don't want to exclude the people who are like maybe not a gregarious person and are just out there, you know, really absorbing and doing well. On the other hand, you've got to be taking advantage of every component of this program. Mm -hmm. And that includes going out there and networking. I mean, you're in this environment with all of these people here for one week. What are you going to do with that? And that does mean, yeah, you've got to get out there, even if it's stepping outside your comfort zone, getting out there and doing that. And certain people, you notice that they are stepping outside their comfort zone and they're just like, okay, I'm going to take advantage of and do this. One thing that I do is... Um, it, it takes a village to run this program. And not only me, but my sort of program leads, you know, the guys like Dave DeFore, Jeff Fellinser, Wes Wilcox, um, Tracy Weisenberg before, um, those people, and Bo Estes, of course, who was new this year, um, those people helped me to put together the program. But also interns are just the lifeblood of keeping this thing running because yep. there's so much to do during that week. And... I don't want people who don't know what we're doing here jumping in and trying to be my intern because this will kill you. So I I take former students, people who've who've been through it from as a student who kind of see it and understand what we're doing here and then I think can dive in and do it. So the top few students from the program in the previous year, 
I bring back as interns the next year. Mm-hmm. And um, every year, um, I try not to be the decision maker on that because I what we'll do is before the closing of the program, I gather everybody together and we just go through the students say, who impressed you, who impressed you, who impressed you and get the the wide, you know, the breadth. Everybody from, you know, the leads to to the top instructors to the other interns this year. It's like, who makes sense for you? Who really stood out? Who impressed you? Who do you think would be good to bring back this next year? Who do you think? Because, you know, I got to say, if there's one level, if you're trying to get in the league, of being an SBC student and what we do for you. Another level is doing it as an intern because then you've kind of, okay, you, everybody in the league knows. You know, Hopefully we have enough of a reputation that they know that if somebody is, first of all, going to be self-selecting enough to do what it takes to get there in the first place and be a student, but then do what it takes to get there the following year on an internship, that, that's going to be a little bit more rarefied atmosphere. And people in the league will call me directly about some of the interns that they saw. And, yeah, and it's fantastic exposure. I mean, the, absolutely. The you, you're you're, you're going to deal with, what, 60 different uh, you know teachers yeah. a year. Right. And it's the who's who, right? And so they'll get to see how you operate, at least in that setting. Yeah. And people like that are you know now working in the It's not that people who don't become my interns, but the percentage of interns who make it is higher than the percentage of just everybody who makes it. And the Liam Doyles and the Connor Williamsons and the Simon Sharon Gordons, guys like yeah. that are, are, are really taking that next step. So but what, what made them, st- I, I'm just curious for somebody who's be, because presumably there's going to be people who are listening, who are going to apply and hopefully get into SBC 2020. What is it that they can do in order to stand out? What's the roadmap? Really good scotch. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when we do that thing where we whittle down, figure out who it's going to be for the next year, I tend to stay out of it. I like I run the discussion, but I'm I'm looking to see who checked the box for the most people around there. Yeah. Right. So if I get four interns, two instructors, you know, guys like that going, oh yeah, that guy was that guy stood out to me because of this. This guy stood out to me because of this. Oh, I had this guy doing this. He scouted with me and he asked great questions. He had some good insight. Things like that. If they're gonna check a wide array of boxes for me, okay, they're gonna make it to the next round. We're just doing process of elimination, right? Yeah. Okay, who we just got twenty people down here in this list. Who are your top ten? And then we just sort of whittle it down to ten on various criteria. Okay. Who are your top five? And then we get it down so it, it's it's checking a lot of boxes, but it, it's kind of like the whole breadth versus depth thing. Yeah. You're checking a wide array of boxes, but you've got to be pretty impressive in some regard, whatever that regard is, and where we think that you're going to be good coming back here. Makes total sense. Makes total sense. And all the people you mentioned, Simon... Um, Dave Dufour. Dave Dufour. Yeah. Well, first of all, he's a freak of nature to begin with. <laughs> you know. Yes, he is. He's, he, he was this, you know, unassuming, you know, high school basketball coach who, in my first year, he he said, you know, he told his wife, "I have no idea what I'm going to get out of this, but it's going to be something." Yeah. And and he delivered and, it in and a and big delivered way. It, yeah, and he stood out right away. You know, just. The, there, there's a level of, of sort of like um, wisdom out of him, coupled with like this gregariousness and this outgoing personality, and like unique look even where he stands out of whatever whatever room he's in, you know he's in that room, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, yeah, he became one of the interns the next year. Um, and I did not set anybody up as being the lead. I like that to happen organically. Yeah. I like which I have jobs for the interns. One's in charge of the rooms, one's in charge of the equipment, one's in charge of social, one's in charge of the students, one's in charge of the guests. I let it f- happen organically where we figure out what's what's who's going to do what. Because if I assign them, it's probably not going to be as good of a set of assignments. But he um, he just sort of gravitated into that lead role and was like running the whole thing. So then the next year I just brought him back as staff and he's been yeah leading scouting video analytics for me and been taking a ton of load off of me. But he's he's also a, just Doing one big of things. those people. Yeah, with the, the athletic now, just doing all sorts of great stuff. It's, he said that we convinced him that he should be in the media. And 
communicating about basketball. So that's that's more, it was more Nate than me, but just saying <laughs> that's where you should be looking. Yeah, and Dave's somebody that'll definitely be on the podcast someday. So look forward to hearing his perspective and his stories about you. I want to get into some, let's, let's do some rapid fire questions to end this thing. I think we're running out of time here. Let's see. Do you I think we can go rapid fire? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and make it less than 17 minutes. How's that for let's rapid fire? Let's go less fire? than two minutes per answer. Let's see if we can do that. What advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Take better care of your back, first of all. Smart. Um, you know, as, as it relates to your career and life and happiness. And yeah, you know, I, because I, you, you could look back on it and say, oh, this is where I, I kind of ended up. If I had done where I ended up from the start, who knows where that would have gone. And I know that that's the obvious answer to give. But I also think that kind of desultory path is part of what makes me me on stuff. And I don't know if I could say, well, go back and do this. I would have been happy. I don't know if, you know, if, if I had done that any other means than, than this whole whirlwind thing that I do, if it would have ended up with that same result. So I, I'm happy with the way I ended up. My advice to my 20 year old self would, would be, you know, save more and, um, you know, invest in Microsoft. And um, other than that, you know, you're, you're on the right track. Believe in it. There you go. When you think of the word successful, who's the person who comes to mind and why? Okay, Andre Ingram. That's who. That's the first name that just came to mind as the answer to that question. Andre Ingram is a guy who toiled, quote unquote, toiled in the G League for like 10 years, who's working as a math tutor, you know, part time, and then got his his shot in a couple of, you know, end of season gigs in the NBA, took advantage of it, you know, loved it. Everybody loved him, realized that dream after toiling away, but still doing a lot of good in the meantime for a lot of people. That to me is successful. There you go. If you could send an email or post a social update with advice for everybody who wants to break into the sports business world. What would it say? Well, the obvious one would be enroll in Sports Business Classroom 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, but but th- that's that's not a flip answer just because we're trying to create something that's going to have value for people. That's really going to fill that niche. If you have people who are, you, you know, I, Mark Cuban used to say, and I brought this up to him in Sports Business Classroom this past year. He used to say, you know, people come up to me and ask me, how do I get a job in sports? And I tell them, don't. Because every job that you apply for, there's a thousand other people who are applying for that. And you want something where you're going to have much better odds. And here's here's what, here's some entrepreneurial ideas. You know, go sell shoelace tips at the airport, whatever. But you're going to be able to build from there. Well, the thing is, you can look at it from this, and this has been a theme here tonight. You can look at it from this point moving forward and going, well, if I'm here and I want to get there, what's the best path to do? There is no great path to do. Is that the path I want to take? Who knows? There could be a better path out there for you. But looking at it from the other perspective, there are people out there who went through that and they made it. Well, mm-hmm. what's unique about them? Really nothing, right? Except that they were dedicated and did the work to get there. Um, and they got caught breaks and were lucky and they knew the right people. You know, there, there's such a huge list of things that are that define the people who on the other end of it were successful that you can't pinpoint any one thing, even determination. You know, we get um, Neil O'Shea speaks at Sports Business Classroom most mm-hmm. years and he does this great thing where he just says, everybody stand up, you know, and this year 87 people stand up. They, okay. If you're not going to work hard, sit down. You know, of course, nobody sits down. You know, if you're not smart, sit down. <laughs> you know, if, if you're, you know, all, all the obvious things, right? You know, that everybody thinks, oh, I'm smart. I work hard. I know basketball. I'm, I'm passionate. I love the game. You know, going through that. If you're not this, sit down, sit down, sit down. Everybody's standing at the end of that. And he goes, oh, none of those things are differentiators. Nobody sat down with that. Nothing separated you from anybody else who's here. All those things, yeah, they're baseline, they're important, but none of this is going to set you aside. So, who here volunteered for your college team while you were in college? If you didn't sit down, like two-thirds sit down, right? Who here knows how to code 
sit down. You know, this goes through all these things that are differentiators. At the end of like three questions, like two people standing. So yep. you two, come talk to me afterward, basically. There you go. That's the truth. I mean, hey, it's not easy, guys. But, uh, you know, hey, there's a lot of avenues. And there's a lot of different ways to get there. Sports business classroom is one of them. It's a stepping stone. I mean, study study the people that came before you, right? And the truth mm-hmm. of the matter is, like you said, Lair, they're just people. They're phenomenal people, but uh, a lot of different people have found different pathways to get to where they want to go. Yeah, well, then the other thing, I mean, this is a really tight-knit community. People, you have to bring value, right? What are you contributing to this? Because it is such a tight ecosystem. It's one of the things that I tend to finish up with where it's like find a way to be a caretaker of this thing find a way that you're going to contribute to it and take care of it and then that'll come back and take care of you Mm -hmm. no question well thank you larry this has been fun of course there you have my friends i hope you enjoyed this interview with the yoda of the nba salary cap larry coon if you did please make sure to share it with your friends Post it on social media and subscribe and leave us a review. You can find the show notes for everything we discussed at sportsbusinessclassroom.com forward slash Larry dash Coon. If you listened and enjoyed the podcast, we'd really love to hear from you. Let us know your thoughts and any follow-up questions you may have by tagging us at Sports Business Classroom and at Larry Coon. Big thank you to our sponsors, Sports Business Classroom Online and Hall Pass Media. And thanks again for listening. We will see you here next week on the Sports Business Classroom audio experience.